I think we've always thought that they're the best dads in the animal kingdom, right? Because they get pregnant, they nurture the offspring. And what our study shows is that it kind of has this dark side. Most fish, uh, such as the ones we see here in the London Aquarium, uh, reproduce in the old-fashioned way. Uh, males produce a lot of sperm, which are very cheap to produce, and females produce a few eggs that are rather expensive to produce, and that means the females are more choosy about the males with whom they reproduce. Now, seahorses and pipefish are unique in that it's a complete reversal. It's the males who get to do the choosing because they incubate the eggs. They are pregnant and it's the only case of male pregnancy we have. Male pregnancy, which occurs in signated fish, is when a seahorse or pipefish carries their offspring in what we call the brood pouch, which is a chamber on the outside of his body. Females transfer eggs into those brood pouches during mating. The male fertilizes the eggs within the brood pouch, and then the male carries the offspring while they develop, and finally, a couple of weeks later, they're born as free-swimming offspring. When Kimberley and Adam were looking at the gulf pipefish, they wanted to know the degree to which the males were actually controlling the state of play. Is the pouch in a pipefish simply a pocket in which you can park baby or pipefish as they develop, or is it taking a much more active and perhaps rather sinister role in the uh, raising of their young? The study of sexual selection is increasingly important in evolutionary biology. It's actually quite a hot topic. Darwin realised how important it was uh, as a kind of handmaiden to natural selection, that as well as the classic natural selection in which the most suited to the environment will survive and, and preferentially breed, there was also this complex interplay between the sexes because males and females invest differently in the young. When Darwin proposed the theory of sexual selection, he dealt entirely with pre-mating sexual selection. So he was talking about pre-mating choice and pre-mating combat for access to females. And so, so the idea is that males are competing for females, and you'll get the evolution of things like antlers on deer and the peacock's tail and all these kinds of um, classic examples of the results of sexual selection. But there's a part that Darwin left out, and that was post-mating sexual selection. So it turns out that after mating, there are things that happen within the female's reproductive tract or competition among sperm from different, different males or something like that that also results in sexual selection. This is what we're trying to study. So it turns out that post-mating sexual selection has hardly been studied at all in these sex role reverse species like we work on. We find pipefish, they occur in the Gulf of Mexico, and they occur in shallow seagrass meadows. And, and they turn out to be really easy to catch, right, because they're really abundant, and they're actually not very good swimmers. Then we can catch lots of fish, bring them back to the lab, keep them alive in the lab, and do our experiments there. Gulf pipefish make an excellent system for this particular experiment because we can observe the eggs directly through the pouch during the entire pregnancy. So if you see, here's his head. And his pouch is down here. This is the seam between the flaps, and you can see how the eggs would sit underneath of that flap there. For this experiment, what we did was we mated the males with several females. We picked either large or small females for each male. If females actually manage to mate with a male, they have to transfer this egg to, to the male's brood pouch and then hope that that male actually invests the resources that are necessary for the egg to survive. Once we saw that they had mated, we uh, looked into the brood pouch using a dissecting microscope with a camera, and we took a photograph of the brood at the beginning, the middle, and the end. So first the egg, right after the females transferred it here, which is yellow now but would ordinarily be reddish-orange. Then one week later, you get this stage. It's pretty small still. This would ordinarily still have a yolk on it, but it's fallen off on this specimen. And then here you have an uh, embryo that's just about ready to be born. So it's quite a bit larger. The snout's longer. The eyes are bigger. It's uh, about ready to be an independent juvenile. The brood pouch is transparent, and the eggs are large. 
so you can actually photograph the brood pouch right after the eggs are transferred and keep track of them throughout the entire pregnancy. So you know for every single egg that's transferred, whether it actually resulted in an offspring at the end of the pregnancy. But what we also see is some eggs that never develop. Um, so those will not show any sign of the embryo tissue and they'll even sort of shrink and change in color over the course of the pregnancy. Then once the male had given birth to that first brood, we paired him with a second female, again either small or large, and we did the same thing again. And so then we could contrast a male's first pregnancy to his second pregnancy. I think we've always thought of the brood pouch as being a structure that evolved to nurture the offspring, right? So the idea is that they're the best dads in the animal kingdom, right? Because they get pregnant, they nurture the offspring, they're transferring nutrients and they're protecting the offspring. And what our study shows is that that can happen, but sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes it looks like the male withholds resources from the offspring. And sometimes evidence suggests that the males can even absorb resources from the offspring. And so it suggests another role for the brood pouch. So instead of just being sort of the ultimate nurturing great structure, it kind of has this dark side. If you picture the male uh, looking for a mate, and he's not meeting a lot of females. And so he decides, well, maybe it would be better to mate with this smaller female. She's not the most attractive female, but she's here. When the male mates with a female that's not necessarily that attractive, instead of investing a lot in those offspring, he's kind of recharging for the next pregnancy, or at least this is what our results suggest, and he's kind of absorb, absorbing nutrients or withholding nutrients from that brood so that he's ready when he gets a more attractive mate to invest more in that particular female's offspring. I think we are filling in a big gap because I think it's really significant that Darwin left this whole big part of sexual selection out. I mean, it's critical. there are critical things happening after mating and they're things that we don't really understand. I handle a lot of papers about um, the evolution of sex and sexual selection, and um, this paper I thought was really neat because what it did was supply a test of the whole idea of sexual selection by showing that it wasn't the fact that some animals were male and some animals were female um, that controlled the process. It didn't matter which gender was which, and here we have a wonderful natural system in which the roles are naturally reversed, and it allows you to show that sexual selection happens just the same um, under pinning Darwin's idea of, um, you know, uh, 150 years ago, and that, I think, is a very satisfying conclusion. <laughs>